So we're going to look uh, at John 11 today. We're going to walk through this together. Is it okay if I come down here with the live stream and everything? Is that okay? Um, so you guys have been going through the book of John. Is this true? Okay. Um, as I approach, is anyone starting to get scared as I get closer to you? No? Everybody okay? All right. <laughs> um, I know Dave wants to say something about that, but... So they, they, they asked me to do John 11, and this is, look, this is a huge story, right? I mean, 44 verses. I mean, we could do a whole series just on this chapter, okay? So I'm not going to try to cover everything here, and I'm not going to try to teach everything that, that's in there and stuff. I'm just going to try to give you a couple things that I felt the Lord showed me, and hopefully it could be, be a help to you, to you guys. Is that okay? Is that fair? We all right? Okay. So let's turn in your Bibles, John 11, and then we'll have it up on here as well. Um, I believe there's also an outline out there. Is there a bulletin or something with the outline in it? Okay, so you have the outline. You'll see that there's the five points in there. Uh, maybe you could have that, and that'll help you if you want to take notes as you go or write down a couple things. Okay. So the big thing here, the, the title of the sermon is what? Does anyone have it there? Anybody want to read that out loud? Okay, good. All right, how about we, we say that all together on a count of three, okay? Don't be afraid. I won't bite, okay? All right, so count of three. One, two, three. The power of partnering with God's perspective. Okay. So the Lord has been teaching me a lot, th this a lot in this season of my life, right? So this is a huge thing, okay? Because we all want to do the, the will of God. We love God so much. And what I'm learning is one of the, one of the keys is just learning to just partner with what he's, he's seeing or what he's saying about a particular situation. And so there's going to be five examples you'll see there in the outline, right? And we'll walk through that. We'll see that together, all right? But it's so powerful if we can just partner with God's perspective on things, right? So Jesus came to do a lot of different things, right? Destroy the, the work of the enemy, to die for our sins, to redeem us. But he also came to model for us what it looked like for a human being, for a man, okay, to walk in intimacy with the Father. And so that's a large part of what he's doing in his three, three and a half years with the disciples, is he's modeling for them what it's like to, to walk with the Father, to walk in intimacy with the, with the Father. And because Jesus was in such intimacy with the Father, then he had such power. He was able to, to move in such power. We know from Philippians 2 that he did not count equality with God something to be grasped, to held on to. He, he laid aside his rights, his privileges, and he walked and he modeled for us what it was like to walk with the Father. And so his whole ministry is spending time with the Father and then spending time with people. Are we okay? Okay? So in John 17, before the cross, he says to the Father, he says, Father, thank you that I have accomplished the work that you have given me to do. That's before the cross. Are we okay? All right. So a big part of what he came to do, in fact, according to Jesus, it's a, it's a huge part of what he came to do was to model for the disciples what it was like to walk with the Father. Right? So he didn't heal everybody, okay? But he healed those, he healed everyone who came to him and asked for healing. Right? He didn't go and try to meet every needy person and preach to every person in Israel. He just walked with the Father. Right? And so each day it was the intimacy with the Father which just led him. And so this is why he was not rushed. He wasn't hurried. He wasn't stressed. Right? Okay, he wasn't anxious. He wasn't depressed because he was in intimacy with the Father. So he walked in that, un, that unbroken communion with the Father. And that's everything. Right? And so because of that, he's able then to just catch the Father's or get the Father's perspective on everything. And then he's able just to partner with God's perspective, which able, enabled him to just to do great miracles and to, to walk in peace and then ultimately be able to suffer for us. Okay? So th this is so important, partnering with God's perspective. So what is God saying about you 
What is God saying about your job? What is God saying about your boss? What is God's perspective on your spouse? What's God's perspective on your kid? What, you're so frustrated with that child right now, but what's God saying about that child? Right? Okay, what's God saying about your pastor? You know, or about the elders? Or about the church? What's God's perspective on it? And if we can partner with that, there's great power in that. And there's great freedom in that. Right? And so I'm learning this in a big way in, in this season of my life. And so we see the, the negative power of that from the book of Genesis. Right? Genesis 3, 6 I don't know if we have that. I don't even know if I gave that to you. But in Genesis 3, 6, we know that the serpent comes along and he's talking to Eve and he's trying to get her to see the temptation to sin through his perspective. He's trying to get her to see the fruit, the forbidden fruit through his perspective. And so in verse 6, it says something very, very powerful. It says, now when she saw that the fruit was desirable to, to eat, and was desirable to make one wise. So all that she did was she just shifted her partnership. She shifted and she went and she took the devil's perspective on that fruit. Are we okay? So then the fall was just a matter of time at that point because she shifted. So she left God's perspective on the forbidden fruit and she partnered with the devil's perspective. Are we okay? All right? That's everything. That's your whole life in a nutshell right there. What is God saying? What is, what is God saying about you and who you are? And if we can really believe that and grab a hold of that and receive that, you know how much healing that'll bring to our lives? You know how much that heals anxiety and depression and confusion and anger and the pain and all this stuff. And if you can get a hold of God's perspective on your marriage, you know how much healing that can bring to your marriage? Right? And so I would submit to you that the enemy, he's always trying to communicate to us. And he's using lots of different ways, media and advertisements and all the stuff we see, all the craziness we see going on in this culture. Okay, he's always trying to get us just to partner with his perspective. If we'll just see things from his perspective. And this is why we see so much division in our culture. But then Jesus comes, right? The second Adam, the last Adam, he comes to redeem what Adam and Eve lost. And so the serpent comes to him also, right? In Matthew 4. And he says, if you are the son of God, Right? Turn these, turn these stones into bread. And what it, so what he's doing, he's offering him, hey, you can partner with my perspective on this thing if you want. And, and Jesus, he had the free will, and we have the free will. And so Jesus, what he does is, what does he do? How does he answer the, the, the devil? He's, he, he answers from, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. So Jesus never leaves God's perspective. He doesn't even argue with the enemy. He just quotes the word of God. The sword of the spirit is the word of God. And what that is, the word of God is the perspective of God. And so what, why we love the word is because the word leads us into an encounter with the living God. And it's the encounter with the living God that is, is what changes us. When we encounter the love of Jesus Christ, that's what changes our lives. That's what we're crazy about. This is why we're crazy people. Like we come in a building and we love each other, right? And we worship and we sing songs. Right? And we eat a lot of food together, don't we? Right? Like we're a peculiar people. We're pilgrims and we're sojourners on this earth. Why? Because we have encountered the living God, the God who is love. And it's love that sets us free. Right? And so it's all about God's perspective, what's God saying, and us partnering with him. So Jesus says, man shall not live by bread alone. Okay? So now what the devil is saying has no power. What the devil is saying only has power over us when we partner with it, when we agree with it.
So Jesus doesn't even get him, give him much attention or anything. He just uses the word of God, bang, bang, bang. And then he goes and says the devil left him for a more opportune time. And I would just submit to you that maybe a lot of the problems you have in your life might be because you're looking at things from the wrong perspective. Maybe you've, you're taking the enemy's perspective on some things. Now, it's not always like a, a like overt, like, here comes the devil knocking on your door and he's coming in with his red tail and his horns and his, you know, his thing and it's, oh, I'm going to partner with the devil. But it's very, very subtle and it's very subtle in our culture because a lot of people and a lot of leaders in our culture, the industry leaders and media leaders and political leaders and stuff, have partnered with the devil's lies. And so that stuff filters down and it filters down into our schools and into our entertainment and stuff. And so when you're in God's perspective, reading the word, you start seeing this stuff a lot clearly, and you start trying to speak that truth, right? And this is why the word of God is so important. It's God's perspective. And so I just want, to, I want us to maybe look at that as we look through, through John 11, and we're not going to have a lot of time to cover lots of stuff, but we'll just kind of look through it. I want you to kind of peep that and see that how, like, Jesus is just operating from God's perspective, even on this, this tragedy of of Lazarus's death. Are we okay? All right. So I'm going to go back and hide behind my pulpit up here. All right. John 11. All right, let's walk through this. The word believe is used six times in this chapter, and I want to submit to you, what is to believe if it's not to partner with God's perspective? Isn't that what believing is? I agree with what God's saying. I make my agreement, my partnership, with what God's saying. Amen? <clears throat> so the first one is partner to partner with God's perspective on trials. And trials could be a sickness. This, in this case, it's the sickness of, of a dear friend, Lazarus. And so we'll look at verses 1 through 6. We'll, we'll break this up. This first section is verses 1 through 6. And uh, do we have an open mic somewhere? Is one of these mics open? No? Yes. I'm hearing, I'm seeing a no and a yes. You guys need to partner with your perspective back there. <laughs> Is it this one? No. Never mind. Here we go. Chapter 11. Sorry, guys. Now, a certain man was ill, Lazarus. That was the Mary who anointed the Lord's, the Lord's, the Lord's feet. So the sister sent to Jesus saying, that, Lord, he whom you love is ill. Isn't it funny that John also said that, the disciple whom Jesus loved? Isn't, this, isn't it funny that everyone thought they were Jesus' favorite? We just buried my great aunt, who's 88 years old, loved Jesus, couldn't wait to go to heaven. And we had a memorial service, and um, everyone was sharing. And everyone was sharing how, like, they knew that they were her favorite. All right? And I'm like, you guys are all lying because, like, I was totally her favorite. <laughs> It's so bad to lie at a funeral, right? Even though people do it all the time, right? It's okay. <clears throat> but when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. It's for the glory of God. So the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now, it's interesting because it doesn't say that Jesus went off and spent time with the Father and then came back and said this. In that moment, he's so in tune, he's so in such intimacy with the Father that he's, he's able to discern right away what, what the Father wants to do about this. Because Jesus didn't resurrect everyone who died in Israel during his three years of ministry, right? We know he resurrected at least three people, which is awesome. But he's walking according to the will of God. He's walking according to God's perspective. And so just right in that moment, right away, he's just able to pick that up, right? He knows when he heard it, right? Because of his constant communion, he was able to discern what God wanted in this situation. And it's interesting because he doesn't say that, oh, God sent this sickness to Lazarus. We know that God is Jehovah Rapha. God reveals himself to us as Jehovah Rapha in the scriptures, which is God our healer. You know, and we know that everyone who came to Jesus for healing was healed because God, he loves to heal. God is a healer. He has healed our lives. He has healed our hearts. He has healed our wounds. By his stripes, we are healed. God loves to heal. We've seen uh, amazing healings in, in Paris in our ministry there. In fact, my great aunt's son, Greg, my cousin Greg, he's um, late 60s, and I saw him in April because we did another funeral for my younger sister who passed away in April, and uh, 
during the luncheon, he was, we were talking, he was talking about how sick, he's been so sick with his digestive problems, these issues for months and months and months, and he was in obvious pain, and he was suffering, and he, was, he wasn't getting any relief from it. And I felt like the Holy Spirit said, well, pray for him. And so I pulled him aside, laid hands on him. We prayed for him right there, right? And then he left, and I hadn't, you know, I went back to Paris and everything, and I saw him for my Annette's thing the other day, and we were talking. He said, you know, Bill, ever since you prayed for me, it's been completely better. It's been completely fine. Right? You know, he said, except the other day, I had a really strong cup of coffee, and it started acting up again. I was like, well, now you know what you can drink and what you can't drink, right? And that's okay, right? So now we know what, what, what's maybe what was causing that, okay? But God loves to heal, all right? And so we see that this, this example of Jesus just partnering with the Father's perspective in this trial, and so he's agreeing with what the Father is saying about Lazarus being sick, right? He's saying, this is not unto death. He, he's speaking that. Now, the thing is, is that Lazarus is going to die, but Jesus is speaking what he's hearing from the Father. He's partnering. Regardless of what the external circumstance says, Regardless if your marriage looks like it's on the rocks, right, or what might be happening with your kids or with your health, right, God might have a whole different perspective on that, your father. And so you want to partner with that. Okay, we love our doctors amongst us, right, but our doctors are not our gods, okay? And so sometimes they're just trying to share with you, hey, what they see, you know, clinically and stuff, a prognosis, di you know, diagnosis, all that, that's fine. But God might be saying something different about that, okay? And we might have stage four cancer, but God might want to heal it. And it's okay to partner with what God's saying and take your medicine. It's okay, all right? So it's just freeing. And I just love this. I love it because Jesus is such an example of just walking in that, in that resurrection life, that resurrection life of Jesus on the earth, right? Isn't that what we want? Like, we, won't, we don't want to be a Christian just to go to church, right? Our church is great, right? But we want to experience the kingdom, like, outside the church too, right? Am I the only one? All right, sorry, I can't really see you with these glasses. I got to take these off. So, all right, but that's the whole thing is that it's not, this whole Christian thing, is, it, the thing is that it's not a religion. And that it's, we can walk with God, Right? And so the glory of God, the Bible says that Christ in us, the hope of glory, that we are the temple of the living God, that the glory of God lives inside of us. And so wherever we walk, wherever we go, whether it's the mall or the workplace or the neighborhood, like we carry the glory of God with us. Right? I mean, that's just Bible, right? But thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place, right? That's, that's just Bible, right? Temples of the living God. And I love this here of just kind of partnering with, with God's, perspective, God's perspective here, Jesus, because it also enables Jesus to live according to the Father's pace. Look at verse 6. It says, And then he stayed two days longer. So he knows that Lazarus is really, really sick, but yet he stays two days. He doesn't rush off based on the circumstance because he's partnering not with what the circumstance says, but with what the Father says. And he's able to rest. He's able to walk, right? Because in the big picture, ultimately, all of our trials and all of our sicknesses are temporary. What is God's perspective on your current trial or your current sickness or the sickness of a loved one? What's he saying about it? Partnering with God's perspective on trials frees us from worry, from fear, from despair, and enables us to be a conduit of vision and hope for others. And it also frees us from the bondage of hurriedness. Okay, coming back to America, we love this country. This is a great and beautiful country. Just like France is a great and beautiful country. Just like Nigeria is a great and beautiful country. It's not a sin to say America is great. France is great. Canada is great. And the American people are amazingly wonderful, great people. And the French people are awesome. And the Nigerian people are awesome. And the Congolese people are amazing people. It's okay to say that. It's okay to love your country. 
It's okay to love America. Okay, don't buy into that lie of all, this, all the craziness that we're seeing out, out, out there. It's okay. So okay. I love France. I love the French people. France is a great nation. Is it a perfect nation? No. Does it have stuff in the past that it, sh- that it should be ashamed of? Sure. But it's okay to say it's a great nation. Germany is a great nation. These are great people. And God loves America. And he loves France. He loves Nigeria. And he loves China. And it's okay. You know? So coming back, we love America. And we love Americans. Americans are some of the most generous people in the world. And evangelical Christians are, they've done studies, are the most generous people in the world financially. But we come back and we see that you guys are in a rush. You guys are running around for everything. You guys are so hurried. Like, slow down a little bit. Relax. You might ha- not have as much health problems if you just slow down and relax. And that's one thing we love about the French culture. You gotta slow down and relax. We have Americans come sometimes and help us out, a little internship or something. You know what I mean? And we, when we do house church or we do church, it's like, it's not an hour or two or three. Like, that's what you're doing today because it's about the people. It's about being with the people, right? It's not about the thing, right? And so we had an intern come. She was from New York, and she was an awesome woman of God, Asian-American, great, great woman of God. But she found that she was doing house church with, with us. She always felt rushed. She always felt like, okay, I got to go because it would drag on a little longer than she was used to, right? And we were debriefing, and she was talking about this, and I said, yeah, it's funny, but like, where do you got to go? And she was laughing because it was just in her mind that she had to go. But she didn't have anywhere to go because there's nothing else to do. Right? So slow down and be present with the people. Look at Jesus. He slows down. He's not in a rush. Slow down. Relax. All right. Number two there. What's number two? What's our second point on the outline? Someone want to read that for us? Anyone want to read that for us? Okay, yeah, that was really bad, okay? So I see I'm going to have to coach you through every point here. Okay, here we go. On the count of three, partner with God's perspective on opposition. Amen. We see that in verses 6 through 18. I'm just going to pick up verse uh, 8 and 11. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, because he wanted to go, through Ju- go to Judea again, and the disciples are like, you know, just totally clueless. Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and are you going there again? And Jesus said, you know, Jesus is funny. He's always answering this kind of esoteric, like, para- parabolic stuff. But it's so, it's so true. Are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he doesn't stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in, in him. And after saying these things, he said to them plainly, our friend, and he said to them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said, well, if he's sleeping, he's going to re- recover. And then he said, no, he's, he's, Lazarus is actually dead. Okay. But I love the fact that Jesus is not afraid to go somewhere where it might be dangerous. I love that. Okay. He knows he's protected. Now, again, this, this story is happening in real time. So Jesus is not going off to, part, to pray to the Father to ask him what he should do. He's in such communion with the Father, and he partners with what God, what he's sensing from God. And I want to submit to you that you have this experience as well, that you can get a sense of what God wants to do in a situation, and you do this all the time, all right? Because Christ is so big inside of you, and sometimes you don't, you just don't realize it, right? So all that Jesus is doing here. Okay, we can do too, right? And so because he's abiding in the Father and he's just walking with the Father, he's able to discern, okay, what the Father wants him to do. And so if the Father's saying go to Judea and go, go visit, you know, Lazarus, it doesn't matter what's in between him and Lazarus because God told him to go visit Lazarus. You, you see what I'm saying? Right? So it's freedom from the fear of opposition and all that stuff. Okay? 
And obviously walk in the day is living according to this perspective of God. This is the light of God, the word of God, the will of God. And that helps us not to stumble. All right? And note that he says that there are 12 hours in the day. And I think it's important we recognize that we have a limited window of time to do things. The Bible says, redeem the time for the days are evil. So make the most of your opportunities to live as Christ and to die as gain. You know, I just buried four loved ones. Four. Sister, great aunt, two uncles who passed away on the same day, June 10th. Okay? Life is fleeting. Anyone over the age of 50 want to say amen to that real quick? Life is fleeting. You know? And younger ones, I love this younger generation. They're so smart. They're so emotionally intelligent, right? And they're so funny with these memes and the stuff and the videos. And there's such a funny intelligence there. And they're so gifted with the stuff. You know, when I have a trouble with, the, with my phone, I give it to Belly. Is that what we call her to here? Belly, <laughs> right? And she's swiping and clicking and popping and snapping, right? And it's all hooked up, right? Praise God. But hey, younger ones, you know, when you're sitting with your parents or your grandparents, put the phone away. You know, and talk to them. And ask them questions. You know, I have an awesome 14-year-old, Karis, and the other night we were sitting together on the couch, and she just started asking me questions. You know, when did you realize this? When did you see that? What was it like for you? You know, and it was great because I had a chance to, to share. And so... Just encourage you. And even us older folks, because we're starting to get infected with the virus too, right? We're always on the phone, right? Maybe there's some apps that you need to delete off your phone. They can help you be, just be more present with people, right? Time is short, man. Time is short. We've been in France over 10 years. We got there at Christmas 2010. Bang. And now it's 2021. I remember when I was a kid, I was born in 1970, so the math was easy. God made me born in 1970, so the math would be easy for me. So I knew at 2000, I'd be 30, right? And I knew at 2020, I'd be 50, and I thought, man, that's, that's like, for, that might as well be 6,000 years ahead, right? And it just goes like that, and especially once you get married and you have kids. Bang, bang, bang. Redeem the time for the days are evil. Send Bible verses to the people that you love. Use the Bible app and send verses to them and tell them, tell them how much you love them co-workers, whatever, share the gospel. Share the testimonies with people. Make time for people. Eat with people. Drink with people. I know we're coming out of the pandemic and all that's been hard and stuff, but make time for people and share the gospel with people. Love people. Share your heart with people. And God will use you to do great and mighty things. Redeem the time for the days are evil. But I love what the... What, and, and I love Jesus here because he doesn't even let it bother him that the disciples don't understand. Because when you do God's will, there's just going to be sometimes people just don't understand it. So verse 16, Thomas says what? He says, well, let us go with him so that we may die with him, okay? Like, that's a little fatalistic, right? It's a little extreme. He was probably from the northeast corridor, corridor of the United States, right? A little negative, Right? <laughs> It's a little, like, a little dramatic, right? He was probably from, from Philly. A little dramatic, a little melodramatic, right? Let us go with him. We, okay, we'll die with him. In one sense, you're like, okay, Thomas, like, you're getting it. Like, you're willing to die with him and stuff, even though he's going to doubt later, but we'll let that go, all right? We're going we're gonna to die with him. But when you obey God and you walk with God and you're in intimacy with the Father and you take risk and you love on people, Sometimes folks are just not going to understand what you're doing. You know? Very few understood when we left everything, including very fruitful ministries in Philadelphia to be, to be missionaries in France, called the Graveyard of Missionaries at the time. Very few understood when we left the French church where we were serving at, which was the fastest growing evangelical church in the country. Very few understand when we left that to plant our little, our little church plant. You know, that French church where we were, we used to have four or five services a day on a Sunday. I'll tell you what, you haven't lived until you've had to preach 
four or five sermons in a foreign language you didn't learn until you're in, you didn't learn until you're in your 40s all right that's like a whole nother spiritual experience i used to preach on a sunday there i was assistant pastor there four or five sermons in french right and so i wouldn't even eat because you know when i eat i get tired and all that stuff so i would just fast through it and i would just go with the holy spirit and it was awesome and i would get through it by the third service fourth service you know i was still i was still going strong look nothing is impossible for god nothing is impossible for god you know but very few sometimes are always going to understand what you're doing and we started our little church plan it was me my wife five kids they were our church staff our five kids were our church staff and then we had three adults from the big church that came with us and two of those left there after a little while and then it was Mimi the woman you saw in the picture there you know but if we hadn't done that Liberté wouldn't exist today we've seen over 50 baptisms in the last few years let's not let opposition or people understanding deter, deter us from the will of God what is your greatest opposition today and I would submit to you that maybe that's something that's internal you ever notice how sometimes we are our own worst enemy? Sometimes my biggest battles are what's going on inside of me. How I'm processing what's happening in my life or circumstances or situations. All right? Because a lot of times I have found deep down inside I have partnered with that which isn't from God in so many areas of my life my view of my parents, my view of my past, my, you know, all of that. And so sometimes our biggest opposition is, is what's inside of us. You know, what does God say about that? Let's partner with what he says. And so partnering with, the, with God's perspective on opposition, it keeps us from living in fear. It encourages us that we're walking protected. It enables us to redeem the time to be active and making the most of each day. All right, number three. Here we go on the count of three. One, two, three. Partner with God's perspective on identity. Now, Jesus walked in his true identity as the beloved son of God. He didn't shrink back from who he was. And we should not shrink back from who we are either. And he's able to release the words and the promises of God based on his relationship with the Father and in secure understanding of his identity as the beloved son. Do you know who you are in Christ? Because that'll change everything in your life. And I love this, this section here. This is, um, verses 17 through 27. And I love verses 21 and 22. So Martha runs to him. Verse, verse 20 is funny, real quick. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Did it ever strike you that Mary might have been lazy? right uh, I'm half kidding but that's okay we know some people who are a little lazier than some others right I'm, I'm kind of lazy sometimes especially when the Phillies are on I can be really lazy maybe she was watching the Phillies I don't know you know you think Martha you know we know that Martha sometimes was frustrated with Mary can you imagine that dynamic those sisters you know we know now with all the personality types and stuff she was probably choleric you know, she probably loved to act, be active, Martha, and do stuff. And Mary was probably more, more melancholy and introverted. Mary was probably an introvert. Martha was probably an extrovert, right? You know? Anyway, that's for free. I just threw that in there. Bonus. Unsolicited. Verse 21. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. So she has some good revelation on, on who Jesus is. She has a pretty good perspective on Christ. But Jesus is even greater than she thinks. And I want to submit to you that Jesus is greater than you can even think or imagine. And so he pushes her a little farther, verse 23. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And she says, so she starts interpreting it, what he's saying, according to her current perspective. But he's trying to get her to a higher perspective. Right? And that's what he's going to do with you, too, as you interact with him. But sometimes we get comfortable, maybe a little lazy, in what we already understand. Is it possible that God's bigger than what you currently understand? I sure hope so. My God is a lot bigger than what I currently understand. 
And so she says, oh, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. So she kind of grabbed a hold of what Jesus was saying to her, and she kind of put that into her, her current theology, her, her doctrine. And he's like, no, I mean now. I mean today he will rise again. Because he's the one who can do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or even think. Martha, your biggest problem is going to change today. And I want to submit to you that your biggest problem can change today also. Because this Christ who is life and who is the resurrection lives inside of you. Jesus says in verse 25, I am the resurrection and I am the life. And this resurrection, this life lives inside of you also. And so your biggest problem can change. It might just be a shift of perspective in terms of what God is saying about your trial, your opposition, or your identity. There are no limits on Jesus Christ. You know the story of the father with the demon-possessed boy in Mark 9? Oh, your disciples couldn't cast out this demon, right? But if you can, Lord, can you do, can you cast it out? And what does Jesus say? I'm sorry, what does Jesus say? If you can, so he, report, he repeats him. If you can, I tell you, all things are possible for those who believe. Now, it's interesting that verse, because I was studying it this week. There's a little bit of a debate exegetically on the Greek there. All right? Because some of your English Bibles will say, if you can, question mark, all things are possible for those who believe. And other translations will say, if you can, with an exclamation point. And so the emphasis is, is key. If you can, emphasis on the can, all things are possible. That's how we would expect kind of Jesus. But what if Jesus was saying, if you can, because all things are possible for those who believe. Yeah. So yeah, I think it's even the King James has it translated like that. If you can, all things are possible for those who believe. Because that last phrase would actually fit much better with that second translation. If you can, all things are possible for those who believe. And so maybe what Jesus is trying to model for us and for the disciples and the people at that time is, hey, if you can get a hold of the Father and you can walk in intimacy with him, guess what? Nothing's impossible. If you can, because all things are possible for those who believe. Just throw that out there. Think about it. Have a meeting about it. All things are possible for those who believe, for those who partner with God's perspective. Why? Because, the, because life and because resurrection is a person. Whoever believes in me, even though he die, yet shall he live. I love Ephesians 3, which I already quoted. Now to him who's able... To do far more abundantly, this is an ESV version, who's able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think. God's even able to do greater, not just than what you ask, but what you can even conceive in your mind. Think about that for a second, what Paul is trying to tell us. God is able to do even exceedingly abundantly above more than you can even conceive in your, in, in your wildest imagination. And how does he accomplish that? What does the rest of the verse say? Because we quote that part, and we never quote the, the, the rest of the verse, which says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we could ask or think, how? According to the power that works where? Where? Within you. If you can, all things are possible for those who will partner with God's perspective. So 
The fourth one is partnering with God's perspective on suffering, verses 28 through 37. Can we see that together? One, two, three. Partner with God's perspective on suffering. Thank you. Thank you for not advancing. They would have been lost. They would have been like, what? Ah, ah. <laughs> I would have lost them. Praise the Lord. Those guys are still arguing back there, by the way. I hope I didn't start a church split today. We just call that multiplication on the mission field. Don't worry about it. There's no church splits on the mission field. We're just multiplying out. <laughs> As the missionary wife laughs heartily in the front pew. Partnering with God's perspective on suffering. I'll just read a couple of verses here, the key verse. Verse 33 and 35. We're almost done. There is hope for you yet. Hold on. When Jesus saw her weeping, and this is, uh, this is Mary, because Mary finally decided to get up and run out and meet Jesus. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. That's a good perspective. That's pretty good. Okay? When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit, and he was greatly troubled. Parentheses, even though he knew what the Father was going to do through him, he was still able to empathize with the people who were hurting around him. He was still able to enter in. Look at this. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. John uses that all the time. And then Jesus wept. And so the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, couldn't he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? Ah, perspective. Interesting question. First, understand that the Lord sees your suffering. And he wants you to know that today, that God is not distant from your suffering. Jesus didn't stay distant from Lazarus. He had healed people from a distance before. He had healed people without going there. And he probably could have done the same here. But he knew what God the Father had told him to do. So he was just walking in obedience. Right? God is creative and he can heal and he can do miracles in lots of different ways. You know, he can, he can set us free in a thousand different ways. But Jesus moves towards the suffering of people. He empathizes with them. He was deeply moved and greatly troubled, and then he wept. And even though he knew that the sickness and even this death was going to be for the glory of God, he wept with those who wept. And in your suffering, I want you to know, I want you to feel Jesus' sympathy and his empathy for you today. And he wants us as his, as his body to see others who are suffering and to see it from his perspective. Weep with those who weep and mourn with those who mourn. Sometimes, beloved, we're more concerned about being right than being love. And how did the Jews know that Jesus loved Lazarus? By the emotions that Jesus showed. It's okay to show emotion. Okay? God's not afraid of our emotions. Sometimes in church, we're afraid of being too emotional. Sometimes we're afraid of emotionalism. Okay, I get that. I understand that. Okay, sometimes we're so afraid of the error that we don't enjoy the blessing of what God has given us. God has given us emotions. You know, here's a newsflash. You can be happy in church. It's okay. You can sing loud in church. You can raise your hands in church. It's okay. And if, if some other people don't want to raise hands, that's okay too. Okay, we don't want to be hand Nazis. Everybody put your hands up. Okay, okay. You can even, you can dance a little bit in church. You know, the Psalms, there's dancing in the Psalms. It's, it says it, dance before the Lord. That's Bible. Okay, remember the prodigal son story? Okay, the prodigal comes back and the father throws what for him? A solemn assembly. He throws a party for him. And it says, when the elder son 
came to the house. He stayed outside. He's talking to a servant. And it says, when he heard them celebrating and dancing, is what it says. They were dancing so energetically that you could hear it outside. Not that you could hear the music, but you could hear the dancing. And that's a picture of heaven. Okay? There's some people who are dancing in heaven. That's okay. Now, what's God's perspective on this? And sometimes we're so afraid of our emotions. We're so afraid of these things that we forget to... Think about our imagination. Think about how God has gifted us with an imagination. It's God's gift to us. But sometimes we're afraid of our imagination. We're afraid, oh, that's new age, or that's this, or that's that. But no, how do we have dreams? God is the God of dreams, right? How do we have dreams? We have them where? In our imagination, okay? How do, when we fall in love and we're, and, we're, and we're being romantic and we're thinking about our loved one and we're thinking about, you know, being with our girlfriend again or our boyfriend again, how, how do we think about that? How do we visualize them? Where? In our imagination, right? And we start thinking about how I'm going to propose or she starts thinking about how he's going to propose and we start getting emotional, right? It's all in our imagination. It's a gift of God. And God gives us dreams through our imagination. And he gives us vision to see things and imagine things through our imagination. And it's okay. And the devil, he knows the power of the imagination. And so he uses the arts and media, you know, and music and drama and movies and all this stuff to take hold of our imagination. Sometimes when we get saved, we want to cut all that off. And we just want to be focused here. I want to focus on the Lord and focus on the Word, which is good. Okay? But we can grow. We can come alive. And we now, because Christ is in us, we can enjoy a sanctified imagination. You know, what if God said to you, what do you want? Because sometimes you say, Lord, you know, what do you want us to do? What do you want this? Way? Sometimes God says, well, what do you want to do? Lord, which job should I take, you know, or should I do this or should I do that? And sometimes as you grow in the Lord, become more mature, sometimes he might, he wants to have that conversation with you. That's what I'm learning. See, when I was back picking a wife and all that stuff, trying to, trying to get a wife. I wanted him to like write the person's name on the sky. I was so afraid. But that journey of me digging deep and trying to understand what he, his will, I learned more about sonship. Because as our kids get older, there's certain you know, standards and structures we want to give them. Live by the word, you know, walk with the Lord, be faithful to God. You know, if you're seeking a mate, you know, that should definitely be a believer, you know, all that stuff. You know, but when it gets down to the details and stuff, we want them to dream. We want them to be alive. We want them to use their imagination. And we'll say to them, well, what do you want? What do you want to major in in college, right? We don't want to have to, di- I, don't, I don't want them to be 40 years old and call me, Dad, what should I buy at the Acme today? And some of us are doing that. We've been walking with the Lord. We've been Christians for 40 years, but we're still praying like we're eight. And maybe the Lord's saying to you, well, what do you want to do? Let's do that together. Right? And so he's faithful to stop us. Right? And so sometimes we want all the steps laid out. We want everything laid out and so that we don't have to walk by faith. But faith, God is faithful not just to give you a green light, but to give you a red light too. So God's faithful. If you start moving in a crazy direction, he's going to be faithful. You know, as long as you're walking to him, as long as you're in that, that relationship with him, you're abiding in him, right? He's going he's to be faithful to lead you through the way. He'll stop you, you know, but everything we do, we do with open hands, right? We walk with open hands. Why? Because we're dead. You know, we're all dead, right? The Bible says it. For you died and your life is where? It's hidden with who? Christ where? In God. So turn to your neighbor real quick and say, I got good news for you, real quick. Turn to your neighbor, don't be afraid. All right, we've all been vaccinated here. <clears throat> all right, turn to your neighbor right there and say, I got good news for you. I got good news for you, you're dead. Tell him that. All right, that's the best news you heard all day. That it's not about you, that you're freed up from yourself. Who's your own worst enemy? Is it Biden? No. Is it Trump? No. Who is it? It's the person looking at you in the mirror. That's your own worst enemy. And here's the crazy part, is that you've already overcome that person because greater is he that's 
in you than he that's in the world. Where are you? You're in the world. Physically, right? But spiritually, you're in Christ. In fact, you're dead, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who, parentheses, Paul says, who is your life, appears, then you shall also appear with him in glory. Okay? To live is Christ and to die is gain. Anything else is a waste of time. Hashtag that baby. Tweet that. Where's my young people at? Come on, tweet it. Come on, tweet it out. She's like, what did he say? Is he done yet? He's going overtime. Dad, don't let him come back. It's not up to Dad. It's up to God. Last one. Okay, it's the last one. Partner with God's perspective on faith. Let's go. One, two, three. Partner with God's perspective on faith. I love this. Verse 40. And I'm skipping so much because I don't got the time, the money, or the energy to read all this today. (laughs) Jesus said to her, well, let's back it up. Verse 38. Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus, not afraid of his emotions. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, <coughs> excuse me, um, Lord, can I, can I talk to you for a second? Yeah, um, yeah. You know, um, by this time, you know, he's been dead for four days, Lord, so there's going to be an odor, Lord. So she's informing Jesus about this. I know that you guys have never done that. You know, you never inform God, you know, about things, you know, when he tells you to do something, right? I love the King James says, Martha says, Lord, he stinketh. <laughs> right? So, Lord, he stinketh isn't like, oh, he didn't put his deodorant on today, right? But you, if you stinketh, like, you really reek. Like, you're really, really, you know, you're almost French is how bad you smell. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> stop it. Stop it. Stop. Behave yourself. You're so bad. All right. Verse 40 is, might be the best verse in the whole Bible. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed that you would see the glory of God? Didn't I tell you that if you would just partner with the Father's perspective and just agree with him, that you will see the glory of God, that everything opens up. The whole kingdom just opens up. If you'll just truly believe, not mental assent, but you'll trust him, and you'll partner with him, you'll agree with what he's saying and what he's trying to do, you'll see the glory of God. You know, God wants you to see his glory, you know, and it's not abstract. You know, it's tangible. The glory of God is here. You know, and the glory of God is in the eyes of the repentant person who receives Christ. The glory of God. And all things are possible now. And all things are possible in your life. And there's no limits on the Jesus who's inside of you. And all things are possible for this church. It's all, all things are possible. If you'll just believe, you'll see the glory of God. There's so much more, beloved. There's so much more in Christ. There's so much more in the kingdom. We read the verses earlier. Brother Al um, read the verses earlier. And we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed to the same image from one degree of glory to another. God wants you to grow from glory to glory the glory for this comes from the lord who is the spirit and we have it all inside of us let the light shine god who said let the light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the what 
of the glory of God in the face of Christ. And where is all that in us? Because he has shown in our hearts Christ in you, the hope of glory. You are the answer to your own prayers if you can partner with God's perspective. If you can, if you can, all things are possible for those who partner with God's perspective. In verse 41, we'll close with this. So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes, and he said, Look, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. So Jesus is already he's operating on a whole different level, and it's just by faith. It's just intimacy. And he, and he thanks God and the power of thanking God. Psalm 100, verse 4 says, Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Right? So how do we get into the presence of God? With thanksgiving. Not with complaining. Okay? The North Philly version of that might be, Enter into his gates with complaining and into his courts with cursing. Okay? No, that doesn't work. Okay? It doesn't enter into his gates with being you know, right, you know, politically or having this right or knowing this or knowing the facts. It says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving. So when you're messed up and you're angry and you're jacked up and you're frustrated with your kids and you're frustrated with your spouse and you're frustrated with your singleness or this or that, you want to get back into the presence of God? Start thanking God. When you start your quiet time in the morning, your devotions, start by thanking God for at least five, ten minutes. Just start thanking God, specifically for all that he says about you in the scriptures. That you have the mind of Christ, that you're a new creation, that old things are passed away, that you're in union with Christ, that you're dead and your life is now hidden with Christ. And you just start thanking God. You thank God. And you make a list. I got my iPhone and stuff and my iPad, and I got my list of my thankful list. And I've been doing that for years, and that thing is like super long. I can't even finish it in my quiet time anymore. Because you know what? I get into the presence of God, Usually by number 10 or 15 or number 20 on my list, I'm right into the presence of God, and now I can feel him again, right? And now I can praise him again. And I didn't even get to my daily Bible reading yet, and I'm already in the presence of God, right? And that's what we need. We need the encounters with God, not just more knowledge, which is good, but the presence of God, the love of God, right? So thank God. Jesus knew that power. Father, thank you that you've heard me, and thank you that you always hear me. But I said this on account of the people standing around, that they might believe that you sent me, that they might partner with your perspective about me. Partnering with God's perspective on faith and thanking God and knowing that God always hears you. Can you say that? Can you say, Father, thank you that you always hear me. God always hears you. He hears every thought. He knows everything about you, and he loves you. And all his promises are what for you? No and get out of here? All his promises are what? Yes and amen, because Christ is in you. And you're the answer for yourself, for your family, and for this world, because Christ is in you. So partnering with God's perspective on faith enables us to see the glory of God, enables us to have increasing revelation, growth in the glory of God, and enables us to know and declare how blessed we are in Christ. All right? Also, young people, don't complain about your parents. Teenagers, don't complain about your parents. You know why? Because they're old. <laughs> and they need help. All right? Have some mercy on them. All right? They're trying the best they can. You know what it's like trying to parent you? You know what? Guess what? You're going to find out, right, when you have kids. You know what grandkids are called? Parental revenge. And you're going to learn. And you're like, Mom and Dad, what? I am so sorry. All right? So you can practice that today. You can practice that. And you can thank them. I challenge you, young people, thank your parents for 10 things today. And then watch them cry, right? And they're going to be all touched. And guess what they're going to do? They're going to buy you stuff after that. <laughs> all right? So just go for it. Trust me. God is with you. He's for you. All right? This stuff works. 
That little one's not even looking at me. He's missing the whole blessing. I'm over here. Here we go. How you doing? How you doing? Just like his father. It's unbelievable. <laughs> All right, let's bow and pray. I got to get out of here. Y'all messing up my sermon. So right now, I just want to invite you. Use your imagination. Because God gives us his word. And when we read the word, when I say the word banana, what do you see? You see a banana. Where do you see it? You see it in your imagination. So God gives us his word, and when we read it, we can see it in our mind's eye. In fact, the Son of God is the living word. He's the express image of the Father. And where do we see these things? In our imagination. And so I want to encourage you this morning. Believe what's true. Believe what the Bible says. When the Bible says, fear not, for I am with you. Can you see him with you? The Bible says it. And God has given you imagination. And so it's okay to see what he says. God is with you. Fear not, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. And I will strengthen you. Can you see him strengthening you right now? For I will help you. Can you see him helping you? And I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Can you just see that this morning? Can you just let God love you this morning? Can you just receive it deep down in your belly, the love of God and the answer of God and the help of God? like you've been asking him. So I just invite you in your, in your own heart just to commune with the Lord for a moment. Before we just move to the next thing, let's pause for just a few seconds. And let's just receive the love of Jesus. Jesus, I pray you just meet your people where they need it, Lord. For some of you, Jesus is just coming just to hug you and just embrace you and just to hold you close. And he's saying, I love you and it's going to be okay. But what is he saying to you in this season? How might he be inviting you to partner with his perspective? What is your biggest fear? What's your biggest problem? Can you just hand that to Jesus and just let him take it today? And what do you need from him? Lord, I need hope, I need grace, I need strength, I need healing. Can you receive that? God is a giver, Jehovah Jireh, God our provider, and he provides the healing and the hope and the strength we need. Can you receive that from him today? Lord, we receive all that you have for us. And we love you, and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.